Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is the sixth video in this dynamic programming playlist where we are covering 16 CSES dynamic programming problems and we are also developing the mindset to solve new DP problems along the way. Now in this video, we are going to be discussing this very important concept of space optimization. In order to understand this topic of space optimization, you first of all need to understand what is dynamic programming, uh, what are states, what are transitions and all of these things. And these have already been covered in the series. So in this video, I will be assuming that you already know these concepts. All right. So let's get started with this very cool concept of space optimization. Now, in order to understand space optimization, there are two questions that you must be asking yourself. First thing is that when you're evaluating the answer of your current state, what are the other states on which it is dependent? For example, when we looked at the Fibonacci problem, we said that dp of n is equal to dp of n minus 1 plus dp of n minus 2. Correct. So we know for a fact that in order to calculate dp of k, dp of k is dependent on dp of k minus 1 and dp of k minus 2. Right. This is the very first question that you must ask yourself. What are the states on which your current state is dependent? The second question that you must ask yourself is, do you really need the answer of every single state to get the answer for your current state? For example, when you said that, okay, dp of n is equal to dp of n minus 1 plus dp of n minus 2. Now look at this equation and let's suppose you already know the value here is x and the value here is y. You already have the value for dp of n minus 1. You already have the value of dp of n minus 2. So in order to get dp of n, you can just add up these two terms x and y and get the value for dp of n. Yes, you don't really need dp of n minus 3 and so on. So let's try to understand this a little further. How were we solving this Fibonacci problem earlier? We were saying that we have an array and we just fill it up incrementally. So we know the value of Fibonacci of 1, we know the value of Fibonacci of 2. We can get the Fibonacci uh, 3 by just looking at the previous two values. This comes out to be 2, then the next value comes out to be 3, then the next value comes out to be 5, 8 and 13. Right, this is how we were evaluating Fibonacci numbers. Now consider this Fibonacci of 4 for example. Consider this Fibonacci of 4. In order to evaluate Fibonacci of 4, what are the two states on which it is dependent? It is just dependent on Fibonacci of 3 and Fibonacci of 2. Similarly, look at Fibonacci of 5. In order to get the answer for Fibonacci of 5, it is just dependent on Fibonacci of 4 and Fibonacci of 3. Not any further. So looking at this example, can I say that for my current state n, if I'm trying to find out dp of n, if it only depends on dp of n minus 1 and n minus 2, can I discard all the other states? So now let's do one thing. Let's consider some more examples and let's see how this works out. Okay. So this was the first example. Fibonacci problem dp of i being dependent on dp of i minus 1 and i minus 2. So we said that all the states before i minus 2 I can discard. Right. This was the Fibonacci problem. This was the problem which we saw dice combinations. The first problem from the series. Okay. This was the transition equation that it had. dp of i is equal to dp of i minus 1 plus i minus 2 so on up till i minus 6. So same is the case here. Your current state just depends on the previous six states. So I can discard the seventh state, the eighth state and beyond. Correct. Same thing. If you have this as your array, if you're trying to find out dp of i, dp of i just depends on these last six values. All the states before this are discarded. They're not even required. Correct. So at any given point of time, I don't need the entire array in my memory. I just need the last six states in my memory. Now let's take one more example. Let's suppose dp of ij is dependent on dp of i minus 1 comma j and i comma j minus 1, right? And I've already said that, okay, this constraints are there. i is going up till n and j is going up till m. So let's try to look at this problem. What is happening here? So first let's draw a grid for this. If you look at any cell i comma j, let's look at this cell i comma j. What are the two states on which it is dependent? i comma j is dependent on i minus 1 comma j and i comma j minus 1. So this particular cell is dependent on these orange cells, this one and this one. Yes. Similarly, if you were to look at this cell, this yellow cell is dependent on these two orange cells, this one and this one. Correct. Can I say that, okay, if you look at this entire row, all the states in this yellow row are just dependent on either the states in this current row or the states in the previous row. All I need is the answers for this particular row. Do I need the answers above that as well? No. 
if I'm evaluating the answers like this, that okay, first I'm filling this row, I'm getting all the answers. Then I'm filling this row, I'm getting all the answers. Then I'm filling this row and getting all the answers. Then for a particular row, I just need the answers for the previous row and not any other row. Correct, the previous row and also my current row. Got it? So what I can do here is that instead of storing an order of n into m type of memory, right, I can just store an order of m type of memory at any given point of time. In order to evaluate the answers for this row, I will just store the answers for the previous row. The entire row is going to have an order of m memory, right? So this is how my overall space is being reduced. Overall, the time is not getting affected in any way, but the space is reducing, correct? So yes, these were the three examples. Uh, in the Fibonacci problem, you know that you're just storing the previous two elements. In this dice combinations problem, you're storing the last six states. And in this example, you're storing the last row. Got it? We'll be actually solving a problem which uh, involves this type of a transition. But I wanted to cover it here itself so that you have some idea of what is happening in space optimization. So let's look at the Fibonacci problem first of all. How can we code it? And as I said, you just don't need anything. You just need the answers for the previous two states, right? So here we are saying that, okay, we have DP of one and we have DP of two. Okay. We have both of these values being equal to one. And then going forward, I will be evaluating DP of three, four, five, and so on. Correct. And this here, finding DP of I or the nth Fibonacci number, I should have written ith Fibonacci number here, right? So how are we going to evaluate the ith Fibonacci number? It is going to be dependent on the previous two Fibonacci numbers. So I'm going to say that your current value is equal to previous plus the second previous. Yes, dp of three is equal to dp of one plus dp of two. Now, once we have found out our current answer, we also need to make sure that when you're going to the next state, your previous states, these one, they have to be updated, right? So what we know for a fact right now is that previous points to dp of i minus one and previous two points to dp of i minus two. But after the ith iteration, when you go for the i plus oneth iteration, your previous one should be pointing at dp of i and your previous two should be pointing at dp of i minus one. So what you can do is that you can say previous two is equal to previous one, making sure that previous two now has dp of i minus one instead of i minus two and your previous two is equal to current. So instead of having dp of i minus one, now it has dp of i. Got it? And eventually what is happening here? Eventually your previous one is going to contain dp of n. After this for loop, your previous one is going to contain dp of n and that is exactly what you want in your answer. So you print that, right? So if you look at the time complexity, that is not changing. It is still order of n, but the space complexity has reduced from order of n to just order of one because at any point of time, you're just storing two variables here. Got it? Similarly, let's look at the, you know, dice combinations problem. Again, what do we need to do? We need to make sure that the previous six states are stored when you're evaluating your seventh state and so on. When you go forward for any dp of i, you only need the previous six states. So what are we doing here? I am maintaining a vector previous. This previous vector is going to store the previous six states. And what was the relation? The relation was this dp of i is equal to sum of dp of i minus j, right? This here is nothing but everything that is stored in the previous vector, right? So initially I have stored dp of zero here, dp of zero is one. The number of ways to construct a sum of zero is just one. And then going forward, I'm just saying that this value current is going to store dp of i. How do you get dp of i? You just add all the values that are present in the previous vector because it only contains the previous six states. So you say current is equal to current plus every single value that is present in the uh, previous vector, right? And finally, you also push this current value into the previous vector. And then you say that if your size of the previous vector becomes bigger than six, then delete the first element out of it. What are we doing here? See, we have this as the previous vector. Initially, let's suppose it contains four values. So you have dp of zero, dp of one, dp of two, dp of three. When you evaluate dp of four, push it into the vector. When you evaluate dp of five, push it into the vector. But now when you have evaluated dp of six, you also push it into the vector and you also discard this value out. Got it? This is exactly what I'm doing here. If the size of the previous vector becomes greater than six, then you discard the previous state. Now again, the space complexity here is not order of n now, it is order of one because you're just storing six integers. So you can call it order of six or order of one. Correct? Now let's look at the third problem, the coin combinations two that we had uh, solved in the previous video, right? And for this, we are going to code it live, right? So this was the code that we had in the previous problem, coin combinations two. It clearly has a space of order of n into x, 
we want to reduce the space to just order of x, right? So essentially, what do we need to do? In order to get the answer for a particular row, for all the dp i's, basically, we have something like this, right? dp of i comma x or dp of i comma k. In order to get the answer for dp of i comma k, I am just going to say that it depends on first of all, dp of i plus 1 comma k, right? So I will store the next row completely. And it also depends on dp of i comma k minus some ci. So this here, dp of i comma k minus ci and dp of i comma k, they are both in the same row, correct? But dp of i plus 1 comma k is in the next row, right? So in order to evaluate the answer for the n minus 1th row, you need the answers for the nth row. So let's call this as a vector next data, okay? This is going to be of a size of x plus 1. Now remember, at the moment, it is going to store dp of n comma k, right? At every single index, the kth index of next state is going to point to dp of n comma k. Got it? So what was the base case here? We know for a fact that if the sum that you want to construct is equal to 0, then the number of ways are 1. But if you have already exhausted all the coins, see, when we are saying dp of n comma k, it means we have exhausted all the coins, we have reached the end of the grid. So if we still haven't been able to construct our sum, which is non-zero, then there are going to be no ways to construct it. So what I can say is that uh, this initially contains zero everywhere, which means dp of n comma k is equal to zero uh, for every single value of k other than k is equal to zero. So I'll just say next state at zero is equal to one. What this means is that dp of n comma zero is equal to one. The number of ways to construct a sum of zero such that you have already exhausted all the coins is one. But the number of ways to construct a sum which is non-zero and you have already exhausted all the coins is going to be zero. So that we have defined here. Fine. So the next row I have. Now what I need to do is that I will be just doing the same thing. I will be iterating uh, in the same manner like I was doing previously. But here I will make another vector which will point to all the answers for my current row. So let's make another vector. Current state. Let's say the size is this only, same thing. And now in order to get the answer for your current state, what does this mean? This means dp of i comma k or i comma sum in order to get the answers it depends on the answers for the next state and also the answers in your current state itself so this thing when you're looking at skipping when you want to skip you are looking at dp of i plus 1 comma sum which is nothing but next state of sum yes because next see if current state is pointing to dp of i comma k or dp of i's the next state is going to point to dp of i plus ones got it so skipping is done what about picking? When you're picking up, you're dependent on your current row. dp of i comma k is dependent on dp of i minus i comma k minus something. So in this case, I'm just going to say this is nothing but current state, right? Current state of sum minus ai. And finally, I am not going to say dp of i comma sum. I am just simply going to say current state of sum, right? What you must understand here is that in this entire for loop, current state of k is nothing but equal to dp of i comma k and next state at k is equal to nothing but dp of i plus 1 comma k. This is what you must remember in this entire for loop. Fine. There is one thing which we are missing uh, which is that okay if you want to construct a sum of 0 such that any number of coins are present that number is going to be 1 right. This is the base case that we had discussed in this problem. So we will just say current state of 0 is equal to 1. If you want to construct a sum of zero and you have these i coins remaining, uh, I mean, this is the set of coins remaining from c i till c n minus one, then the number of ways are going to be one. So now what we need to make sure is that if we have evaluated the answers for a current row and then when we are going to the i minus one row, then the next state which we were looking at, it should now be pointing at the current row, right? So finally, I will just say that next state is equal to current state. And finally, now our final sub problem will not be dp of 0 comma x, but it will simply be dp of or next state of x, right? Because next state after this entire for loop finishes just points to dp of zeros, fine? So this is the idea behind this uh, entire, you know, uh, solution. And I hope this thing is also clear to you that how we reduce the space from order of n into x to just order of x here. Alright, so that was it for this video guys. I hope you're enjoying the series so far. Uh, if you're enjoying the series, don't forget to smash the like button below and subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to not miss any future updates on the series. One more thing, if you are understanding whatever is being taught in a particular video, uh, don't forget to comment understood 
in the comment section because that helps me realize that okay what i've taught you have been able to understand and if there are any doubts that you have related to any video don't forget to comment it down and i would love to help you